Hi dad, it's me, your June, or as you always love to say, your little Junie bug. Dad, I miss you, especially now, especially today. We lost another patient, his name was James. When he came into the ICU, he was barely conscious, but he smiled when he saw that picture I have of you. You know, the one in your flight suit from Vietnam. That was the last time he was awake. I stayed by his side for three days. That was it. He was gone. I looked at his chart and he was 98. He lived his whole long life, probably surrounded by a loving family, grandkids, great grandkids, only to die alone. This isn't fair. COVID has taken so much. It took you. We didn't even have time to say goodbye. Mom drove you to the hospital. Josh and I thought you would be there a day at most, but she came back alone. She couldn't even be with you at the end. No one could, just like James. Daddy, I'm alone now too. I've never been scared to be a nurse. You know it's what I wanted to do. But when COVID hit and we lost you, I was terrified to go to work. Mom and Josh are all I have now, and Josh, you know how bad your grandson's asthma is? He can't get this. I wanted to quit. I just wanted to stay home with Josh. But we need money. So here I am, stuck in the hospital, too afraid to go home and risk infecting my son. Mom moved into our apartment to take care of Josh. And I'm here, sleeping on the couch in the nurse's break room. A few other nurses are doing the same thing. They're worried about their kids, their elderly parents. Our only hope is the vaccine they say is coming. But until then, the only time I get to see your grandson is to read him a bedtime story over Zoom. You know he always talks about you. You were his hero. You always will be. After James died, the doctor gave me contact information for his next of kin. The doctor knows I always want to talk personally to my patients' families in case they have questions about their loved one's final moments. It's the least I can do. James's next of kin was his grandson, a young man named Javon. Javon told me something amazing. James was a military pilot too. He was a member of a group called the Tuskegee Airmen. Apparently they were the first African-American fighter pilots in US history. They fought in World War II when the military was still segregated. I had no idea. Javon said his grandpa's bravery and determination was his inspiration for pursuing his own music career. He said his granddad always told him that if he wanted to do something, not to let nothing or nobody stop him. He also told me that one of James's fellow Tuskegee Airmen, a mountain named Harold Brown, had written a book with his wife, Marsha, about his experience in the war. It's called Keep Your Airspeed Up. I think your grandson needs to learn this story of these brave men. I do too. Something hopeful in these awful times. After the call, I ordered a copy for myself and Josh. It's going to be delivered to the apartment tomorrow as a little surprise. I thought we could read it together for our nightly Zoom stories. I think this story will remind him of his granddad. Hi, sweetie. Mom. Are you coming home? Not yet. Soon. How was your day at school? Ugh, same old, same old. Looking at a screen, listening to Mr. Franklin's boring voice. Dude needs a better mic for his computer. Josh, that's not nice. Sorry. At least we did science today. I was the only one with my camera on. I felt like such a nerd. 
Mom, I got the package you sent. What is it, a puppy? Ha, try keeping your goldfish alive for a few more weeks before we start talking puppies. Open it. Cool, a book. A book about airplanes? That guy looks a little like Grandpa. What is this? Read the title. Keep your airspeed up. The story of a Tuskegee Airman. What's a Tuskegee Airman? A pilot like Grandpa was? That plane looks like it's from World War II. I know as much about the Tuskegee Airmen as you do. I thought this would be a fun way to learn about them together. You know, our new bedtime story. We definitely need a new one. We went through all the Harry Potter books already. Is this a true story? It is. And the man who wrote it, Harold Brown, is still alive. Really? He must be older than Grandma. Shh, don't let her hear you say that. Mom, can I read this one out loud, the whole book? Absolutely, as long as your voice isn't as boring as Mr. Franklin's. Mom, that's not nice. Get going, mister. Mom is getting sleepy. So there I was, a thousand feet above the ground, over Nazi-occupied Austria, in a P-51 Mustang, climbing away from the total wreckage of a German locomotive I had just shot up. When my airplane's engine stopped, bailing out was my only option. I landed in deep snow. When I looked up, all I could see were two men with rifles pointed on me. Whoa, intense. Keep going. My story actually begins in Minneapolis, Minnesota, some 20 years before jumping out of that plane. I'm sure it really began with my parents' journey from the deeply segregated south of the early 1900s, all the way up to Minneapolis, Minnesota, where I was born in 1924. Mom, what does segregated mean? It means that African Americans weren't allowed to eat at the same restaurants, go to the same schools, or even drink out of the same water fountains as white people. That's messed up. So I couldn't go to school with my best friend just because of my skin color? Exactly. Segregation was around even when your grandma and grandpa were growing up. That's so stupid. I know. This next part talks about Harold's parents leaving the South. My dad, John H. Brown, was born in Talladega, Alabama in 1892. He went to college and enlisted in the U.S. Army towards the end of World War I, but he didn't stay in Alabama for long. One day, he went to the local hat shop to try on a hat. The first hat he picked up was too big, so he put it back. The owner of the store ran after him and told my dad he had to buy the hat because he had tried it on. Apparently, black people were not allowed to try on hats without buying them. My dad refused to buy the hat. So the owner called the sheriff. The sheriff tried to make my dad buy the hat, but my father wasn't having it. Soon after this incident, he decided he had had enough of the South. He traveled north, along with many other African American families, looking for a brighter, better future with hopefully less discrimination. This was called the Great Migration. But especially back then, if you were black, racism followed you wherever you went. My mother, Allie, was born in Alabama in 1901, and like my dad, it didn't take long for her to want to leave the segregated South. For my mom, it was being pulled from school and forced to do the back-breaking work of picking cotton for almost no pay. This made she and her mother leave for the North. My mother and father were my role models. They showed me that if you really wanted something, you had to work hard to get it. My mother had dreams of me becoming a pianist, she loved listening to me practice in the front room, but I had fallen in love with a different sound, the sound of a roaring plane engine. I don't know exactly why it happened, but at the age of 11, I had fallen head over heels for airplanes. That was that. I decided to be a pilot. No more piano lessons for me. That seems like a good place to stop for tonight. Come on, Mom. I'm not even tired. I'll see you tomorrow night, sweetie. Same time, same place. No reading ahead. Fine. I better rest up so I can stare at my computer all day tomorrow. That's the spirit. I love you, Josh. Give Grandma a hug for me. I will. I love you, too. Good night. And, Dad, for the next month, every night we escaped the boredom, sadness, and isolation of our closed-off lives and took to the sky as free as a bird with Harold Brown, a man who would let nothing stand in his way to achieve his dreams. I began reading everything I could get my hands on about flying. 
My friends started to tease me about my passion for planes by calling me Lindbergh. Lindbergh? Charles Lindbergh, a famous pilot from the 1920s. Oh, not much of a burn to call Harold a famous pilot's name, but whatever. Some even said, hey Lindbergh, they won't even let you wash those planes, much less fly one. He needs new friends. I worked all sorts of jobs to earn money for flying lessons. One of my jobs was a soda jerk. Wait, soda jerk? <laughs> it's just an old timey way to say a person who makes milkshakes, like a Dairy Queen worker. Keep reading. I could only afford to take five flying lessons, but it was enough to learn the basics of flight. After graduating high school in 1942, I had two important experiences. First, I took the exam to get into Tuskegee Tuskegee Army Flying School, and second, I enrolled in the National Youth Administration Program, which was designed to help young people get jobs. Of course, I enrolled in the aviation program. In this program, we built two gliders. My friend and I were assigned the rudder assembly. It was beyond thrilling to watch the glider take flight. Around this time, I became aware that the U.S. was becoming more and more involved in World War II, but the war did not influence my decision to be a pilot. I knew that the easiest way to learn to fly and get good training was in the military. As a black man, I was grateful that by the time I joined up, the issue of the African Americans being allowed to be pilots had been cleared up. At the end of the 1920s and into the 30s, it was simply assumed that black men had no place in an airplane. They should stick to manual labor, know their place, that sort of garbage. A lot of these racist ideas came from fake science about how African Americans were less brave, less able to work hard, and less intelligent than white, white people. These racist ideas kept talented, capable pilots from serving their country. It was com a complete injustice. Fortunately, when Franklin D. Roosevelt won his third term as president in 1940, he promised that African Americans would be trained as military pilots in the U.S. Army Air Corps. In 1941, the War Department announced that African American pilots would be trained at a segregated base in Tuskegee, Alabama. That year, another significant event took place in Tuskegee. Eleanor Roosevelt, the president's wife, decided to visit the air base. When she arrived, Mrs. Roosevelt said she wanted to take a ride in one of the planes. The officers suggested a white pilot, but Mrs. Roosevelt insisted that a black pilot, Chief Alfred C. Anderson, take her up instead. The story made all papers and caused quite a stir. We Tuskegee Airmen like to think that Eleanor had something to do with convincing her husband to fully support sending African American fighter pilots into the war. She knew that like any other American, we had the right to fight for our country, even if a portion of our fellow Americans didn't support the right to do so. I wanted to fly more than anything, and if that meant flying in a war risking my life, then I was ready. But first I had to pass the Army's Air Corps mental and physical tests. Out of the 104 men who took the test that day in Minneapolis, I scored the fifth highest. Math and science were my two favorite subjects, and that was a big advantage. Hey, Harold is just like me. People call me a nerd for loving math and science, but to be a fighter pilot, which is like the coolest job ever, you had to be a nerd. Ha, go nerd. Go nerds. So he passed the mental test. What about the physical test? Let's see. When I went for the physical test, I flunked it. I was too skinny for my height by just a few pounds. The doctor weighing me pulled me aside. He asked, do you like milkshakes, young man? I said, I'm a soda jerk. I make milkshakes all day. He said, here's what you do. Drink three milkshakes every day, a few days before we weigh you again, and don't go to the bathroom. Guess what, I passed, and then immediately got sick. <laughs> That's awesome, I gotta try that sometime. The best way to cram for a test, ha. Ew, mom, cringy. Keep reading, soda jerk. Soon, it was time for me to pack up and say goodbye to my mom and dad. I was going to Tuskegee. Before I left, my mom sat me down for a serious talk. My mom's advice shocked me. 
It was, now when you go south, treat people very respectfully. It's yes ma'am and it's no ma'am. You may even have to step off the curb and onto the street to let white people pass you by, but you do it and you don't open your mouth. I responded, but ma, you mean I have to step down onto the street just to let white people pass? She spoke sternly. Listen to me, boy. You've never been in the South, but I have. I know how those people are in the South. You listen to me or you will get yourself into a whole lot of trouble. So with her advice and a goodbye hug and handshake, I was off. This could have been the last time I ever saw my mom and dad, but I didn't think of that. I was going to be a pilot. My first days of the South, my mom was talking about, happened on the train ride to Alabama. On the train from Minneapolis to Nashville, I rode in a nice, comfortable Pullman sleeping car. But when we got off the train in Nashville, something odd happened. When I approached the ticket booth, the ticket agent took one look at me and told me to go around to another ticket window. When I arrived at the other window, the very same ticket agent was waiting for me. It was then that I saw the colored sign above the window. So this was the South my mom was talking about. Even though I had tickets for another Pullman sleeping car, I was directed to a cramped car directly behind the train's engine. The only people in this dingy car were African Americans. The ride to Tuskegee was awful. The whole time smoke and soot from the engine blew directly into our car. I was going to fight for my country and I wasn't even allowed to keep my suit from getting filthy from soot. I had to swallow my anger. Everything here was segregated. The restaurants, the movie theaters, the drinking fountains, even the bathrooms. This was the first time in my life I had experienced this sort of racism. It was ugly. I was relieved when I finally arrived at my destination, Tuskegee, Alabama. Here was where the real business of becoming a fighter pilot began. Boy, it wasn't easy, but I was young, and I was over the moon with the excitement. Every day we did the same routine, up at the crack of dawn, Saluting the stars and stripes. Morning exercises. Breakfast. And then flight class. We had coursework in aerodynamics, physical sciences, and a course in weather. We learned about all the controls and mechanics of each aircraft. After weeks of study, it was finally time to get into the air. My first few solo flights were pretty sloppy, but it wasn't long before I settled in and really started flying. It became second nature, just me and the wide open sky. We practiced every maneuver that the aircraft was capable of safely performing. But it wasn't all fun and games. Flying was serious business and horrible accidents happened. One of those accidents took place after we had graduated flight school. I remember like it was yesterday. Richard Bell was the last flight of the day. He put his plane in a steep dive from 30,000 feet. Some of the guys and I were relaxing in the barracks when we heard the screaming of his engine. It was getting louder and louder. Oh my God, we thought, is he ever going to pull up? Seconds later, we heard the plane slam into the earth. It sounded like a thousand pound bomb had gone off. There was nothing left of his plane but a smoking crater. Richard Bell was one of the best pilots in our group. Man, that's terrible. I bet he was really young too. He never got to see his family again. Do you want to stop for the night, honey? No, I'm good, Mom. I want to see what happens next. It looks like Harold is going to war. After combat training, we were ready for the real thing. At least we thought we were. As pilots, we could be a little cocky. Soon we had landed in Ramatilli Air Base, Italy, our home sweet home for the duration of the war. It was in Italy where we met a living legend, Commander B.O. Davis. All black airmen, including me, had heard about Commander Davis's treatment at West Point, America's best military college. Because of the color of his skin, Davis was given the silent treatment by his classmates. He was barely spoken to for four years. They wanted him to quit but Davis went on to graduate towards the top of his class. Now he was our commander. We were in awe of him. In Italy, we were introduced to the finest aircraft in the war, the P-51 Mustang. The plane was a powerful beauty. 
The P-51 was fast, nimble, like driving a Ferrari through the sky. Our main mission as fighter pilots was simple, protect the heavies at all costs. The heavies is what we call the B-17 bombers. Our job was to escort the B-17s on their bombing runs from Italy to Germany. It was an extremely dangerous job. Throughout the war, the B-17s had taken heavy casualties. These big bombers were vulnerable to anti-aircraft fire as well as attacks from German fighter planes. Each time a heavy was shot down, it took 10 men with it, a horrible loss. Our job was to escort the bomber formation to the initial point, or IP, that's where their bombing run began. The IP was basically a cloud of black smoke from all the flak or anti-aircraft fire. The Germans were shooting up at them. We had to let the bombers make the journey through this deadly cloud alone. Our small planes would have been ripped to shreds in an instant. We would fly around the flak and wait for the bombers on the other side, hoping some of them would make it out alive. Waiting was horrible. We could see the enemy fighter planes waiting to finish off any damaged planes. But they had to deal with us. Those bombers were so happy to see us. We Tuskegee Airmen were red tails as we became known, while significantly less bombers in comparison to other groups. Us, the same men who would be refused a sip of water from a non-colored drinking fountain, became the most requested fighter group to escort bombers in the war. After our missions, we'd like to gather around a good fire and swap stories. One night, a fellow airman told me about his uncle, a veteran of World War I. He told me his uncle had been severely wounded in the war. A German shell had taken his eyesight. His uncle returned home to Georgia, blind and unable to find work. One day, he accidentally bumped into a group of white men hanging out in an alley. They beat him to death. He had his uniform on, his medals of bravery, and they just left him there to die. I heard many such stories. Sometimes it was hard to fight for a country that didn't treat you like a man, but it was our country too, and we weren't gonna let anyone stop us from defending it. That's right, Mom. These pilots had to fight two enemies, the Nazis and racism. They deserve all the medals in the world. Are you okay with all this? It's pretty heavy. Mom, it's reality. I'm not a little kid anymore. I know the world isn't fair. I see things on the news, things in my own life. I know that we still have such a long way to go. It's not like these things just stopped happening after Martin Luther King did his I Have a Dream speech. True, but maybe that's enough for tonight. Did you put out milk and cookies for Santa? Please, you know this messed up year Santa is just sitting up in the North Pole watching Elf on Netflix and online shopping. I hope he orders me a puppy. Nice try. Merry Christmas, Josh. I love you. Love you too, Mom. Stay safe. Honey, I heard there might be a vaccine soon. Sure, we'll see. Happy New Year! Whippy! So much to celebrate. I know, I know. It was December 9th, 1944, and by this time we were used to enemy fighter planes just flying around not willing to engage us. At this late time in the war, Germany had lost most of its more experienced pilots. Now they were just putting up kids with hardly any training, too timid for a real fight. That's what we thought anyways. We were about to encounter the most advanced plane of the war, the ME-262, one of the few jet planes of the war. Man, were these things fast. That day our group was providing cover for the bombers when all of a sudden we were jumped by nearly a dozen enemy 262s. One of the German jets flew right towards me and my wingman. As he passed, we only had a chance to let off one burst of gunfire. Suddenly the jet rolled over and performed a split S. We dove after the German, shooting the whole time. Just as we were about to open up on him, the jet leveled off. Now we have fire! Suddenly, the forest blew out erupted with gunfire. The German had led us into a flat trap. We were being lit up by every gun imaginable. I was losing fuel. Soon, my engine would be dead, and so would I, if I made the wrong move. 
I began to talk to myself. Now what are you going to do, Harold? You going to bail out? You going to use the parachute? I don't know. I got lots of time. I'll worry about it later. I am just going down, down, down. The good news was that I was in friendly territory and had found a place to crash land, an abandoned airstrip. The bad news was that the Germans had dug a ditch across the airstrip. A ditch I didn't see until the nose of my plane got stuck in it. I quickly popped the canopy and rolled out of my poor plane, lucky to be alive. Youthful exuberance can be dangerous. The second time I had to escape a damaged plane, I wasn't so lucky. March 14, 1945, it was my last mission. The mission was simple enough, simple but dangerous. It was a strafing mission. Strafing missions are where we would fly low and destroy enemy structures, air bases, and supply trains. On this mission, we were looking for trains, and it wasn't long before we saw the telltale steam from a long line of trains. It was going to be like shooting ducks in a barrel. We dove on the trains and began taking them out one by one. The whole time we were being shot at by guns on top of the trains and guns from the cars, but we were getting them off. It's like we couldn't miss. Then on our way back to base, we saw a huge locomotive. Hey, one of my fellow pilots said, somebody missed one. It's always the last one. That's the one that always gets you, the last one. I told everyone to clear out of the way. As I dove in, guns blazing. I can still picture it today. The train engine was huge, a perfect target. But just as I was closing in, the boxcars opened up and German soldiers began firing at me. I had no choice. I had to keep slamming that engine with bullets. Blow up, blow up, come on, blow up. I got my wish, just as I passed over the engine. It exploded. I felt my plane shudder as shrapnel from the train tore through the P-51's body. I climbed into the air. I didn't yet realize how badly my plane was damaged. Suddenly, the engine coolant sprayed all over my nature. The engine was toast. I knew at that moment I had to bail out. I popped off the canopy, released my seatbelt, and dropped into the sky. I was about to land in enemy territory. I looked down and saw the ground rushing up at me fast. Boom! I hit the ground hard. It had landed on the side of a mountain. I saw a small wooded area and I began quickly gathering my parachute. I needed to get to those trees. I needed somewhere to hide. But it was too late. Two men on skis came gliding towards me. One of them had a rifle. That was it. I was caught. I was led at gunpoint towards a small mountain village. The villagers must have seen my plane go down because they were all there waiting for me and they were angry. American pilots had been making bombing raids in this area and we were public enemy number one. The fact that I was a black man didn't help either. Many people here had bought into the Nazis' racist ideas. They began screaming at me, throwing garbage at me. One of them had a rope. Suddenly, I was surrounded grabbed from all sides. I saw in horror that they were leading me to a tree, a tree with a rope. This was it. I was going to die. I pictured my mom and dad receiving the news of my death. Someone please wake me up from this nightmare. And then I felt one of the men grabbing me let go. I opened my eyes to see him rolling on the ground. There was a police officer, a police officer with a gun. He yanked me back and pointed his gun at the villagers. They slowly backed away. He had just saved my life. He was yelling in German. We were backing away from the villagers. He led me to a pub and pushed me inside. I saw in horror that the villagers were running towards us. We shoved tables against the door, trying desperately to keep them out. And then a chair came crashing through. The officer ran out the window with his gun, and luckily the villagers backed away. The police officer made a call to some German soldiers nearby, and soon I was loaded on a train with a few other captured Americans. We are headed to Germany, into a prisoner of war camp. As our train rolled towards Germany, I heard a familiar sound. The hum of P-51 Mustang engine. My excitement soon turned to horror as I realized what was about to happen. They were going to try to blow up this train. They had no idea. I was inside. I threw myself to the ground as bullets tore through the boxcar. This was not the way I wanted it to go. Killed by my fellow Tuskegee Airmen? 
Lucky for me, the German train made it to a tunnel. And to safety, well, if you consider a German POW camp safety. Hey, Mom. Hey, birthday boy. Thanks, I guess. Don't really feel much like celebrating. Oh, honey. I'm stuck in here. You're stuck at the hospital. Harold is stuck in the POW camp. We are all just stuck and alone. Hey, why is it your camera on? You're just gonna have to excuse your mama, sweetie. I just pulled a double shift. Let's just say I'm not looking my supermodel self tonight. Gee, I didn't realize you were so vain. Hey, Mom, can we finish the story tonight? We are almost there. I want to see how Harold gets back home. Of course, honey. Go ahead. At the camp, we are all lined up. An SS officer in a long leather coat paced back and forth. Then he stopped and spat directly into a prisoner's face. I was shocked to see one of my fellow Tuskegee Airmen, Lincoln T. Hudson. Civilians had beaten him almost beyond recognition. Some Tuskegee Airmen, like Walter Manning, had it even worse. Manning was publicly hanged by a mob of angry civilians and German pilots. Nazi propaganda had demonized black pilots, portraying them in racist posters as gorillas with long tails, purposely targeting innocent women and children. I was lucky the police officer had protected me. I often joked that it was in the prison camp where I experienced integration for the first time. There was no segregation in the POW camps. Some of us were officers and some of us were enlisted members of flight crews. But the war was getting closer to us. We could see the explosions from the American bombs only a few miles from our camp. It was a strange feeling. We were training for our boys, but we were also terrified of being killed by an American bomb. The Germans were getting nervous too. They forced us out of the camp, and for weeks we were marched through the sun, rain, and cold. All we could think about was food, food and home. But no matter how far we marched, the American army was surging up behind us. Then, on a beautiful day, we were liberated by General George S. Patton's 14th Armored Division. The Germans had all fled as they heard the tanks rolling up. We were free. I can't describe the feeling of walking into my childhood home in Minneapolis and seeing my parents again. Being reunited with your loved ones after a long separation is the greatest gift you can imagine. He made it. After all that, he made it home. Wait. I think Grandma is knocking on the door. Hold on. Mom! Sorry I didn't get you a puppy. Your mom is your gift this year. I hope that's okay. You're home. You're home. I'm home. Mr. Brown, I just wanted to let you know that your story, your courage, and perseverance really helped my mom and I get through a very hard time. Thank you so much. Hi, Josh. Thanks for sending me the note, and in particular talking about all of my courage and how I persevere. But when I think of what you and perhaps your mother went through, you certainly displayed a heck of a lot more courage than I've ever had to display in my lifetime. So I'm real proud of you. What can we young people do in our lives to help honor the legacy of the brave Tuskegee Airmen? Uh, Josh, you asked uh, a rather interesting question of me in terms of what can young people like you do and your effort to maintain the legacy of the Tuskegee Airmen. Well, let's talk about it a bit. First and foremost, you have to stay in school. That's a must. If you fail to do that, then you've already have lost most of the ball game right from the get-go. So you gotta stay in school, you have to get your education. Then, there were several principles that I think that most Tuskegee Airmen displayed and achieving whatever goals that they may have displayed. One was aim high. Think as big as you want to. Don't allow any 
What or anyone to limit you and tell you that you can't do this, you can't do that. Always aim as high as possible. Second, you have to believe in yourself. And that's common. If you don't think you can do it, then you never will do it. So you have to believe in yourself. Third, you got a wonderful brain up there. So use it. The good Lord gave you a brain and he gave it to you for a reason. Use it. Fourth, never quit. Nothing is easy, I guarantee you. And I have failed in so many things in my life, but it was always try it again. And you keep doing it over and over until you get it right. So never quit. Always be ready to go. You never know when an opportunity is going to hit you in the face. And if you aren't ready for it, then shame on you. That might be the only opportunity that you will ever have. They don't come around in big baskets full. If you're fortunate, you'll get two or three of them. So you got to take advantage of it. And always expect to win. Never go into anything assuming that, oh, I can't do it, I'll never be able to do it. No, no. Make up your mind that once you get into it, you're going to win. You're going to work as hard as you can to make winning possible. Make sense to you, Josh? Okay, sir. See ya.